Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. This is episode three of five on our series on terrorism. I am Trace, and we are talking all about it, where it came from, how it came to be, how recruiting works, but now we've gotten to what is it that terrorists want? And really, where does it blossom? Where does it pop up? A lot of people think war-torn areas are prone to terrorism, right? War breeds terrorism. But that's not really entirely correct. What is more accurate is that oppression breeds terrorism. Anywhere that people feel oppressed, terrorism seems to bloom. And that feeling doesn't necessarily have to be valid. They don't actually have to be an oppressed people, as long as they feel oppressed, even in their heads. Or, you know, sometimes people's beliefs are being oppressed, and that can cause terrorism to pop in. And it's, it's bad, obviously, but oppression is something that we can identify. Oppression is something we can fight. And again, this doesn't have to be real oppression. It can be oppression in our own minds. The thing is, because it's oppression, we don't really know what terrorists are after. So many groups over the years have had so many different purposes, so many different goals, and that has caused so many misunderstandings. So let me, let me give you some examples. ISIS, for example, Major General Michael K. Nagata, the Special Operations Commander for the United States in the Middle East, admitted that he had hardly begun figuring out the Islamic State's appeal. We have not defeated the idea, he said. We do not even understand the idea of ISIS. President Obama has referred to the Islamic State, or ISIL, as Al-Qaeda's JV team, which is proven to be completely inaccurate, by the way, considering the group now rules an area larger than the United Kingdom, it's probably more like the other way around. Al-Qaeda was like the middle school JV team, and ISIS is like the pro team with the big lights and the commercials. Politically speaking, terrorism takes a lot of different forms and has a lot of different interests. The IRA, for example, was mostly about driving the British out of Northern Ireland, although it's taken a lot of twists and turns along the way. The Muslim Brotherhood, which was undoubtedly Islamic, but they haven't acted out in religious ideology. They actually draw members from various different sects and belief systems. It's more about fighting unjust or corrupt government for them. Many terrorist groups crave recognition or political or social change. For example, Hamas and Hezbollah. They want to see destruction of the Jewish state of Israel, and others want to fight on behalf of the Palestinian people. They're fighting for political and social change and recognition. Racial, left-wing, right-wing, single-issue terrorists. There's extreme groups for almost any political ideology, and again, they all come back and distill down to oppression, whether real or imagined. ISIS takes that oppression and they have blossomed it into this incredible thing. And now they're acting on a lot of that oppression and they're doing it in the strangest and most awful ways available to them. For example, ISIS is destroying historical sites. They're destroying antiques. They're destroying museums. You see it on the news media all the time. An ISIS propaganda video describes the Prophet Muhammad's destruction of idols in Mecca as an example of why ISIS is now destroying all this stuff. This is human history and they're just messing it up. It's awful, it's my opinion. They went on to say in their propaganda video that these statues and idols, these artifacts, if God has ordered its removal, they became worthless to us, even if they are worth billions of dollars. However, Bringing it back a little bit to earlier, ISIS is extremely strategic in all of their messaging, which means a lot of this might just be for publicity. Have you guys thought about that? Supposedly, ISIS is busy looting archaeological sites and supporting its own agendas by then selling those things, selling those antiquities, and having this illegal trade of these historical artifacts to help fund themselves. Regardless, it's, I mean, it's insanely tragic. The destruction of historic sites is, is terrible. I can't even put into words how upset it makes me, but many of these destroyed items, they're links to the birthplaces of human civilization. That's terrible. So let's say we wanted to get those back. What could we do? Probably nothing. 
it's it's illegal to trade with a terrorist group. But that brings us to, does the United States negotiate with terrorists? This is something that is in like every terrorism movie ever, but whether it's actual US policy is a little more of an ambiguous question. The funny thing is because people see it in movies, they assume it's US policy and they put it on their signs and they wanna run around outside and they say like, the US doesn't negotiate with terrorists and they go on TV and they say the US doesn't, that's not actually true. It's, dif it's a little difficult to say yes or no one way or the other. The policy against negotiating with terrorist kidnappers kind of comes from the early 1970s when terrorists started kidnapping diplomats and other government officials to attract publicity. They wanted to get their comrade prisoners released or they wanted to demand a ransom or payment. But as the trend continued, the U.S. adopted a policy where they would refuse to negotiate with terrorists in 1973, when two U.S. diplomats were taken hostage by the terrorist group Black September in Khartoum, Sudan. Now, they didn't want to negotiate, but they were willing to talk to the terrorists. They did not release a convicted terrorist. President Nixon put it like this. He made it abundantly clear. He said in a press conference, as far as the United States as a government giving in to blackmail demands, we cannot do so, and we will not do so. Now notice, he didn't say, we will not talk to you, we will not relate to you, and we will not communicate with you. He just said, we don't give in to blackmail. That's not not negotiating, but it did kind of become the law of the land after that. There have been many cases of Islamic extremists capturing young Westerners and holding them hostage, and the U.S. will set free a militant responsible for the deaths of American citizens. This happens because it's more about hostage negotiation instead of giving into blackmail, paying to support terrorism. A very recent example was Bo Bergdahl. He was a U.S. Army soldier who was held captive by the Taliban-aligned Haqqani network in Afghanistan. And after his release in trade for five prisoners that we released, he was charged with desertion. And it was a big scandal. I'm putting that in finger quotes, of course. So it begs the question, should the U.S. swap prisoners? And it brought up a lot of different things about whether we were negotiating with terrorists. If you want to know more about Bo Bergdahl and all of the stuff surrounding his release, check out Test Tube News. It's a show we do specifically about world affairs, politics, and news. It's much shorter than Test Tube Plus. Check that out. They have a whole episode on Bo Bergdahl. The best known example, though, of the U.S., again, air quotes, negotiating with terrorists was the Iran-Contra affair, where the Reagan administration sold missiles to Tehran to secure the partial release of American hostages, which were held in Lebanon. Not too long ago, the U.S. was hit with a difficult situation regarding a kidnapped reporter by the name of James Foley. The difference with this example and previous examples is that Foley was a private citizen, not a soldier, a former soldier. He was held hostage by terrorists, and the U.S. made it clear they would not negotiate with those terrorists and especially not pay ransom. However, Bo Bergdahl was a soldier being held by an enemy during a time of war with the U.S. A prisoner exchange is different from a private citizen being captured. Prisoner exchanges under these specific circumstances are not all that uncommon, and they do not help finance America's enemies. It's just a normal transaction in a time of war. We don't want to do it, but it does happen. We don't always know what the goals of a terrorist organization is. Each terrorist organization is going to have their own set and list of goals. The question is, do they accomplish those goals. Does terrorism work?